I'd like to welcome everyone to the China Lecture Series. Um, the lectures today in the workshop conclude a three-year relationship and grant that we've had with the East-West Center and would like to say how appreciative we are of this partnership. We have, PCC has benefited greatly. Over the last three years, we've had 12 of our faculty who have gone through intensive education about China. And we have been able to add three courses on China, as well as establish a Chinese language program actually two years before our academic planning um, uh, had scheduled. So we certainly got a jump start on that. Uh, we have infused um, Asian studies uh, into eight of our courses. And that pretty much represents an opportunity for our students to learn about China across the curriculum. And that is something that is very special to PCC. So I'd like to welcome you to the day's events. Uh, I hope you get um, a lot out of the presentation. I hope that you enjoy the presentation. It is all for you. And we thank you very much. And Peter, we thank the East-West Center again. Thank you for this great relationship. Now I'm going to introduce Dr. Howard. Thank you. It is my great privilege today to introduce our guest lecturer for this morning. Zhang Shudong is a professor of comparative literature and Chinese at New York University. Among his visiting and advisory roles are Chung Kong Chair Professor at Peking University, where he directs the International Center for Critical Theory, and Chair of Academic the Academic Committee of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities and Social Sciences at Chongqing University. Born in 1965 in Beijing, Zhang Shudong received his BA in Chinese from Peking University and his PhD in literature from Duke University. A prolific scholar writing in both English and Chinese on topics ranging from literary criticism and theory, modern Chinese culture, to political, philosophical discourses on modernity. He is the author of Chinese Modernism in the Era of Reforms, Post-Socialism and Cultural Politics, Traces of Criticism, and Cultural Identity in the Age of Globalization. Please help me welcome Zhang Shudong. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's uh, such a delight to be in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, just a personal note, about 10 years ago, I was seriously entertaining uh, uh, moving to Oregon uh, to have my career here. It was at the University of Oregon in, in, at Eugene. Uh, it didn't work out. It was very traumatic. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it's nice to breathe this fresh, sweet air uh, once again. Uh, today, I, I have two uh, talks back to back. One is on literature, the other is on Chinese dream or Chinese identity. Uh, they are closely related to each other uh, thematically uh, as well as uh, in terms of uh, issues of representation, cultural politics. I will begin with the one on Moyen well, on literature uh, by discussing two of his uh, uh, novels. Uh, uh, my main argument uh, is that Moyen offers a wonderful uh, uh, prism uh, through which to look at Chinese reality. Uh, this reality, this thing called China, is semi-mysterious because it oftentimes uh, frustrates our uh, uh, search for analytical, rational certainty. Uh, or sometimes even basic des description, what is China? What's going on in China? Yeah. Uh, uh, but Mo Yan, on the other hand, is, is a writer who just, you know, as you know, uh, received a liter uh, Nobel Prize in Literature last year uh, for his hallucinatory uh, realism. It's a carefully coined uh, phrase to avoid uh, a more familiar, more famous uh, well-established phrase, namely magical realism, uh, referring to the Latin American boom in the 60s, 70s, 
uh, 80s. Uh, but they're similar. They're similar in the sense that you know, the magic is the real, the real is magic in the, this sort of uh, uh, dialectics. Uh, but primarily in its sense of history, how convoluted it is, how, uh, 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 how tortuous it would be for any uh, uh, literary enterprise to try to capture this reality without succumbing to, uh, surrendering to uh, uh, its logic. Uh, uh, oftentimes that's the logic determined by uh, social economy, <laughs> politics, uh, uh, cultural customs, tradition, law, uh, these uh, social scientific topics. Literature will have to strive for its own autonomy, its playfulness, its creativity, its vividness. Uh, and Moyen, I think, uh, 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 stands out as a very interesting, compelling example. So I So these two uh, uh, works are both beautifully translated uh, into English by Howard Goldblatt. Uh, I understand some of you have read uh, at least one of these two works. One is called The Republic of Wine. It uh, was published in uh, 1993 uh, uh, first. Uh, was reissued uh, over and over again. Uh, which is one of the major uh, novels uh, published by Moyen. And uh, this is the most, almost the most recent uh, novel. Uh, I think coming out in 2006 or seven, uh, called The Life and Death Are Wearing Me Out. Uh, I'm going to talk about these two. Uh, 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 at the same time, sometimes cutting back and forth between the two. Uh, uh, in order to, to uh, hopefully illustrate the, the particular ways by which uh, Moyen uh, makes it possible for us to gain an access to this thick reality called China. Okay. Uh, Republic of Wine, I think, is a, uh, uh, I don't know how deliberate it is, but it's a mistranslation of some sort. Uh, the literal hard translation would be uh, kingdom of hard liquor or something like that. Uh, Republic of wine it simply sounds too nice. Oregon would be a Republic of wine. <laughs> if you think about Pinot Noir and uh, all that. All that. Uh, but if you go delve into this novel, you realize it's not a republic. It's kind of a bad land, evil empire, you know, underworld, uh, you know, uh, mafia land, that sort of thing. It's a land of uh, ca cannibalism. And, uh, and uh, crimes and all kinds of uh, weird, outlandish things. Uh, and the wine, there's no such thing as wine in liquor land, but it's hard liquor, uh, baijiu. Right? Baijiu is, it cannot be translated into uh, white wine, but r rather hard liquor. It's much stronger than vodka. Uh, uh, the story is very simple. A top gun sort of investigator, uh, government investigator, is sent to uh, Liquorland uh, to uh, investigate this rumored, kind of, uh, 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 alleged cr uh, crime committed by the locals uh, of eating babies. So it's uh, cannibalism, which as a theme, it goes back to the very beginning of modern Chinese literature. At the very origin of modern Chinese literature, cannibalism stands out as a powerful symbol. Uh, Lu Xun, uh, the, the foremost writer in modern China, uh, writes in his uh, Diary of the Madman, the very first short story written in vernacular Chinese. Okay. Uh, this, uh, uh, this story about cannibalism, uh, the allegorical moment comes when the protagonist, accused of being absolutely crazy, mad, you know, the madman, you know, who sees everything clearly through this, you know, this uh, perspective of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 paranoia. Uh, he sees everybody is out there to get him. And uh, one evening, he stares at the, the history books of China, you know, so-called 5,000 years of civilization. 
and he reads between the lines uh, the way only a madman could possibly do, and he sees only two characters, a Ren, eat people. So that's Chinese history. So it's a very strong moral, metaphysical accusation of, uh, 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 of Chinese tradition. It uh, symbolizes the rupture. It's an epistemological rupture. It's a moral rupture. Uh, by cutting off this, con this continuity, a uh, new China, a new China, a new people, a new culture, a new concept of man could possibly be conceived. So at the very beginning, at the very conception of modern China or Chinese modernity, this, the image of cannibalism is right there. You know, so so it's, a, it's a heavily loaded uh, imagery. Uh, Mo Yan plays around it. Uh, it's more playful, it's less serious, less weighty, but equally dark, if not darker. So this thing is, uh, this cannibalism in liquor land is, uh, is not, uh, there's nothing uh, metaphysical or ontological, it's just uh, for pleasure. It's like eating sea, sea sluts or chicken feet. If you go one step further, why not newborn male babies? Uh, they, they constitute such a delicacy and uh, they develop special ways of preparing the, these little babies. Uh, that's the crime for which the state will have to respond by sending this top investigator. But that, of course, is only the, uh, the setup. So the novel unfolds as this investigator, the, the policeman, moves in and uh, the whole thing just unravels. If it begins as a normal, normative sort of a detective story, it quickly uh, crumbles down into something magical realist. The policeman, uh, this investigator sleeps with the mistress of his main primary suspect, who turns out to be the party propaganda department chief, you know, very subversive. Uh, um, um, and it, uh, the deeper he enters this uh, liquor land, the more he's, uh, uh, he finds himself entangled with uh, uh, this local network through eating, through sex, through jealousy, through competition. Uh, as he loses his moral compass, uh, he gets closer and closer to the enemy. But at the point at which there's no longer enemy friend distinction anymore because he becomes the, uh, the opposite. I mean, the pe things and the people exchange places so thoroughly and fundamentally. The whole thing is blurred to, uh, into a, uh, a swamp of desire, of imagination, of hallucination. You know. uh, everything is very energetic. Every banquet scene is described with all this energy, creativity. Those of you who have been to China know how your toast hosts could propose a toast in such a lethal way. If you don't drink this cup, you know, ganbei, all the way to the bottom, they will start crying, they will kneel down, they will mention their parents or grandparents and their ancestors. They'll pull all kinds of tricks just to get you drunk, uh, to show their hospitality. In, in many, areas in China, people still do that uh, today. Uh, and Mo Yan turns these otherwise, uh, I mean, they, they would still constitute as extremely good, powerful satire, you know, or realist kind of representation of uh, cultural customs, of corruption, of you know, waste, all that. But Mo Yan turns that methodically, systematically into a kind of a, uh, indexing what's going on in the, the sort of the Chinese uh, uh, collective mind. For instance, in order to, to get uh, the investigator uh, 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 drunk, the local directors of a coal mine uh, keep coming up with proposals. Let's propose uh, uh, a toast in the name of the Chinese working class. Well, that's a way to indicate symbolically the mere mentioning of working class solidarity, right? Uh, uh, labor, uh, you know, communism, those kind of things still hold some kind of water. It, at least uh, uh, they could still get people uh, to drink. Ironical, but nevertheless, uh, it's real. 
Or that I would rather propose this toast in the name of my dying mother. She's already 80. I'm such a filial son. You have got to drink this with me. Well, filial piety, you know, tr Confucianism, traditional values. It goes on and on and on. Uh, from uh, high culture, officialdom, uh, discourse of officialdom, to, uh, to unofficial kind of discourses. Uh, uh, the language from the criminal world and, and so on and so forth. Everything is lumped into, into this one coherent, endless, carnivalesque, uh, kind of uh, this, this ritual of banqueting, which is China today. The, 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 the more you read into this, this absurd scene, the more you realize this is real. This is, uh, uh, whereas a realistic, a conventionally realist, uh, representation of the scene could not possibly capture the complexity, the con other contradiction, the disunity, and the weird energy and productivity of, of, this, uh, uh, of this sort. That's just one small example. But overall, the structure of the uh, Moyen, of course, uh, as an uh, uh, extremely inventive uh, formalist, would not satisfy uh, himself uh, 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 by merely uh, coming up with kind of a local uh, stories or images, allegories, but the overall narrative structure is where he invests the most. You know, the form, the structure itself stands as some kind of, establishes some kind of a, uh, uh, a framework uh, for understanding of China. Uh, so the novel uh, functions at the sa three levels at the same time. First is this normal, conventional detective story. A guy is sent to a, a place to solve a case. Rational, you know, properly f fictional, follows the logic of, 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 of the fiction. You know, uh, characters, plot, you know, uh, background, description, all that. But then, there is another layer of uh, running throughout the novel as an integral part of the novel, which operates at the level of the correspondence between Moyen, the fictional Moyen, you know, also by Moyen, this famous writer you know, uh, in China, with, uh, between this Moyen and the, within the fictional space of the first detective story. And uh, a local guy called Li Yido, who has a PhD in, um, wine production, liquor production. Uh, it's all very weird, very absurd, ridiculous, you know. Uh, uh, whose father-in-law is the, the expert the, you know, who dominates the field, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but this Dr. Lee, instead of uh, committing himself to uh, producing the most uh, 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 popular, you know, uh, most uh, 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 the, uh, the strongest liquor, let's say, in China. He turns out to be a, uh, 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 a amateurish writer who wants to use his personal connection to Moyan, uh, being constructed you know, through these correspondences uh, to get his, himself published in national literary magazines. And, uh, yeah. So the, the letters sent back and forth between the two forms another very systematic index of what's going on in the Chinese cultural sphere. Uh, uh, backdoor connections, power relationship, uh, using all these uh, uh, jargons, terminologies, uh, the table manners at the local level, the national level, among elitist writers, modernist circles, realist circles. Lido, this, uh, this local young uh, writer, uh, in order to push himself into the, you know, his imagined the high literary society in Beijing, represented by Moyan, mobilizes all he knows uh, into this, you know, he writes to Moyan in order to impress him, right, this fictional character. But he does that over the top, oftentimes uh, too heavy, ha ham-handed. It's just a whole series, of non-stop series of, of embarrassingly uh, uh, aesthetic and a political overkill. Uh, usually the, the, the form of exchange would be 
uh, I offer some kind of local anecdotes. So in order for you to consider me a useful kind of a local asset. So say, here's my little story. Could you read it? Could you get this published? So it offers a whole series of satire and you know, a mockery parody uh, of Chinese literary cultural production. Uh, this anachronistic nature of this, uh, this, this mumbo jumbo uh, is so coherent. Uh, it's such a powerful kind of uh, 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 reflection on the on the uh, on, on um, uh, it, I would argue it's a better history of contemporary Chinese literature than all these official uh, 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 histories of, modern, uh, of, of, of contemporary Chinese literature. Uh, this is the second level. Uh, of course, it's supposed to happen in real time, right? It, this is reality and not fiction. It's written in terms of correspondence between the two. And uh, uh, this is the second layer. The third layer is, constitute, is constituted by nine short stories, completed, you know, done, short stories, works of art sent to Moyen by this Dr. Li. Yeah. Uh, it's set apart from this correspondence, which pretends to be real. And these short stories are you know, literary works. They are the most astonishingly creative uh, bad literature. It's a world-class writer uh, giving us an ex almost complete example of, uh, of sort of, uh, let's say, everything that could go wrong, did go wrong when it comes to writing short stories. But they are so bad, they, they, they become hilarious, uh, worth reading. Uh, uh, these nine stories, um, uh, uh, depending, you know, scholarship has it uh, is still contested the issue whether these nine stories, each of them, corresponds to one particular uh, paradigm of writing or Lu Xun or you know realism, socialist realism, romanticism uh, offers a more systematic, their immediate parody or mockery of all these uh, uh, major works in uh, modern Chinese literature but the content of which also reveal what's going on in, uh, in liquor land, you know, what's going on in people's mind, what they do. Of course, these are not realist, or these, these are not a reportage or a you know, realist depiction, but rather uh, the self-style, the high modernist, and a stream of consciousness, magical realism, or critical realism, uh, that's bad, a kind of a, but these, extremely uh, poor, uh, willful, uh, provincial, uh, uh, and uh, 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 f forced kind of literary forms manage to uh, represent what's going on in Liquorland far better than all these properly fictional, properly narrative literary forms would have uh, accomplished. Uh, the reader is trained while reading Moyen's novel, is trained to adjust their mind's eye in order to uh, be able to translate the literary mechanism of distortion, uh, absurdity, uh, exaggeration very, very accurately into uh, what a normal language would, uh, uh, would deliver. Uh, so this is the sort of the third level. My argument, a more bigger argument is that it is this internal uh, uh, fracture, uh, division, not so much, not so uh, 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 much about the uh, literary form as about the consciousness itself uh, uh, that gives rise to this, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the cognitive uh, value, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of the critical uh, value uh, uh, to Moyen's literary uh, enterprise. Uh, because what's uh, being suggested here is, is you need not one mind or one mi set of mind's eye to look at China. You need at least three. And they are 
uh, these are like the compound eyes of a certain kind of uh, insect or uh, animal which could uh, possibly map out the territory, uh, the space uh, more thoroughly uh, 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 either because of the complexity, uh, the, the fragmented nature of this reality or because the overwhelming amount of information of uh, you know, uh, different uh, 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 experiences and memories and languages and customs, all that, the, the coexistence of a, of a host, uh, of, a, uh, of a multiplicity of historical experiences and memories, all condensed in one time space, that requires a literary uh, uh, mechanism which is internally multiple, contradictory, and yet sort of attached to each other in a coherent way. That, I think, uh, lies at the heart of Moyen's so-called magical realism. Otherwise, if you look at Moyen uh, at a relatively superficial level, you could uh, uh, walk away with the impression that he is just an, a, a, a latter-day Garcia Marquez or this Latin American uh, 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 a writer uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, rearranging temporality, uh, 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 mix blending memory and uh, imagination, uh, magic, magic and a rea reality. Uh, but I think it's this in internal uh, struggle uh, with uh, its own object of uh, 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 its own environment that uh, uh, that. Uh, 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 that uh, gives rise to this extremely powerful uh, uh, way of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of literary production. Um, and uh, to talk about Liquorland, one should not uh, 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 conclude without saying a few things about uh, drinking. You know, drinking is such a uh, uh, central uh, theme in this in this uh, novel. Drinking, as you know, it also goes back way back to the Chinese literary tradition, uh, Chinese poetry, Chinese uh, uh, essays. All these the, this grand classical tradition uh, has drinking at the, almost at the very center of it. You know, uh, it's a way to usually it's the man of letters uh, moving away from this brutal world. Uh, to define, to carve out their own kind of autonomous uh, uh, domain of uh, freedom, imagination, creativity, to forge their own community. Right? The famous uh, little town poetry by, uh, poem by Li, Li Bai or Li Po is that uh, he drinks all by himself. So this really is a poetry about a poem about loneliness, solitude. But it says that the, but the poems goes like this. It said, I raise my glass to a cup, you know, to toast to the moon. With the moon and with my shadow, the three of us are drinking together. So it's a very kind of a, a, a classical way of inventing one's uh, commun community of, of, of freedom uh, uh, in the middle of this secular, you know, this uh, uh, court intrigue, war, you know, this is, uh, famine, all these uh, 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 you know, worldly things. And Moyen's drinking is, is different. It's not um, characterized by its uh, uh, high cultural aspirations, its personal individual freedom, its sense of uh, 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 privilege. Uh, uh, but rather, drinking is a, a more reliable, uh, reliable to, to us, to the readers, who has an interest in uh, understanding China. Yeah a more reliable kind of a way of, uh, of, of being, uh, of, a, of existence. Only when you are tipsy, when you are drunk or semi-drunk, you see the world clearly. So all the most uh, vivid, compelling, uh, scandalously uh, graphic you know, scenes uh, in the novel, which turn out to be highly representational, uh, are perceived, captured uh, 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 by uh, a kind of a experience, perceptive or experiential mode uh, uh, conditioned by two things. One is the investigative, the, invest, uh, the uh, investigator is on the run. 
So you only see the world clearly on per, in your peripheral vision. If you turn around and look at it in a sustained, concentrated way, you don't see much. You see lies, you see uh, this Potemkin village, you, you, know, you allow yourself to be fooled by this thing called the reality. But if you are on the run, if you, know, you only see that uh, in, a, in a rush, that impression, that image sticks with you. you know, uh, and it becomes entrenched, but at the level of unconscious. So this is almost like a, uh, this Proustian way of capturing this uh, memoir involuntaire. It's just you don't try to recollect intentionally, right? Because those kind of uh, recollections are not good material for literature. But if you are hit by hit by a smell, an odor, by some kind of childhood memory, they they have to come back to find you. You cannot go out to find them. So, so this on the run, this criminal's mode. Uh, for Moyen is a very good way to cut through the thick of reality and let yourself, the, the mind, uh, be overwhelmed, flooded, you know, swamped by, by, by that. Uh, then in this helpless uh, struggle for mere survival, you forged a real relationship with reality. So that's one part of this kind of a precondition. The other is getting drunk. Uh, whenever you are drunk, you see the whole world sort of turning around, swirling around, but uh, uh, the, the, the world has lost its structure, form, all these solid kind of uh, you know, uh, arrangements, uh, usually official institutional arrangements. They, everything starts floating around in terms of color, image, you know, all these things. For instance, um, when, he, when an investigator uh, is dining or drinking with uh, uh, his, the subjects of his invest investigation. You know, oh, it's, it's just crazy. Um, he n can never tell the party secretary of the coal mine from the director of the coal mine. Everybody looks similar. When he uh, goes through the door on his way to the bathroom, there are usually two beautiful male, uh, female waitresses, uh, uh, two waitresses in red tea pal, you know, and he could never tell one from the other. They both look gorgeous, and, but they both look unreal. He often says, well, he wants to touch them to see whether they are plastic or real human beings. So those kind of impressions uh, 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 reveal a, a kind of a China uh, uh, that is so real in terms of, in technical terms, you know, in terms of social economic uh, uh, reality, in terms of uh, uh, institutional reality. I would just read one uh, uh, passage, uh, actually two, just to give you uh, a taste of this. Uh, I'll begin with the one I first found. Uh, uh, this is when the detector, okay, finally, he gets so jealous with, uh, 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 of, of a, a very short local tavern owner who turns out to, uh, the, 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 the woman, the, uh, the mistress of the party propaganda department secretary turns out to be the mis also the mistress of that tavern owner. But he, since he's already, uh, he falls in love with this mistress, uh, finding that she's the mistress of yet another uh, uh, local sort of a criminal, gets this investigator extremely jealous. He shoots her between the eyes, and this, of course he starts running as a criminal himself, right? Eventually, of course, um, he sort of uh, falls into a pit and, uh, and uh, drowns. So this is, the, uh, bear with me, this is disgusting, uh, but this kind of a graphically disgusting final scene, the end of the investigator, is so to the point of this whole narrative uh, setup. Uh, <clears throat> and he falls and he, he realizes he's sinking. Uh, he said, I, pro I, I protest. Dingo, or this name of the investigator, screamed as with a final burst of energy, he dashed toward the pleasure boat. But before he got there, he stumbled into an open-air privy 
filled with a soupy, fermenting goop of food and drink regurgitated by Liquorland residents, plus the drink and the food excre excreted from the other end, atop which floated such imaginably filthy refuse as bloated used condoms. It was fertile ground for all sorts of disease, carrying bacteria and microorganisms, a paradise for flies, heaven on earth for maggots. Feeling that this was not the place where he should wind up, the investigator announced loudly, just before his mouth slid beneath the warm, vile porridge, I protest, I pro. The pitiless muck sealed his mouth as the irresistible force of gravity drew him under. Within seconds, the sacred panop uh, panop panoply, panoply of ideals, justice, respect, honor, and love accompanied a long-suffering special investigator to the very bottom of the privy. So this is the, the, the how strong it would go. Uh, this is the, the other end, right? But the novel lavishes on the first end, eating, drinking, you know, and, uh, and it form, forms this uh, a cycle. The other passage I, I couldn't find it uh, in, in a second is when it's, it's, it's about this on the run kind of peripheral vision thing. Uh, the investigator, after shooting the, the woman, uh, runs for his life and he smashes through the, it hap takes place in a, in a tavern earned by this little guy. So he has to escape from the kitchen that kitchen scene uh, is so memorable. It's, it's like all this steam and the heat and all these uh, uh, nameless, uh, faceless people uh, preparing chicken, animal, vegetable. Everything is so primitive. It's like an underworld, underground, kind of mafia-run restaurant, right? And yet it's so orderly. Uh, I happen to read it as a kind of allegorical image of the Chinese sweatshops, who, which produce all these goodies for Walmart, and which overwhelm the whole world. It's primitive, uh, it's, it's industrial, it's modern, right? Because it's mechanized, it's industrial. And yet, the particular organization is, is so, uh, not only pre-modern, it's prehistoric. It's organized in a myth mythic, sort of a way in, in, from the land of mythology. And yet it's very orderly, uh, very uh, disciplined, very efficient. Efficiency, productivity is the key. You know? And uh, before he runs through the, 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 the back door of the kitchen, he, uh, the moye and the stomach, uh, that doesn't forget to mention one particular pile of melting ice of something very weird and all of a sudden uh, this I mean I guess it happens as you are running uh, you can still your mind is still busy processing these things right and it says oh, all of a sudden the, 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 the investigator realized this is the the raw material for uh, the second best known uh, 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 dishes a dish in liquor and the first the most well known is the steamed or, or you know uh, a bra braised uh, 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 male boy you know that's the, uh, the, 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 the the meat boy the second most famous is called uh, uh, dragon and phoenix happy together uh, it's a <laughs> it's a dish uh, featuring the uh, male female genitalia of donkeys yeah. and he realized that pile of Melting ice is the frozen male uh, donkey penises, and uh, and uh, you know, uh, sitting on the ground, melting, you know, dirty, filthy, smelly, right? But soon to be turned into this delicacy, this this, this uh, high banking, you know. So this little detail uh, sh shows you the, the, the kind of uh, the depth into which Moyen. Uh, would uh, delve and uh, come up uh, in, uh, in the form of absurdity, hallucination, uh, magic, uh, uh, in order uh, to form a kind of a, a faithful uh, representation of China. Why faithful? Let me explain this. Uh, the novel uh, 
is, uh, we, we know for any fiction to work, it's not only fictional uh, kind of a substance, uh, imaginative or uh, uh, a lot of them will have to be description, right? will have to be uh, uh, this sort of uh, commentary. And uh, uh, the, whenever uh, Moyen tells us the, the environment, gives us a basic orientation of liquor land, of the passage from this uh, Beijing or the provincial capital to liquor land, he gives us this extremely interesting, compelling picture of uh, uh, what I would call post-socialist China. Uh, you see these uh, different modes of production s sitting next to each other so vividly. Uh, whenever there's a traffic jam, for, for, for instance, on the local road, right, as he, the investigator approaches the coal mine and runs into a traffic jam, and he looks around extremely frustrated, and you know, uh, there's a tractor, you know, people's communes age, uh, and there's this heavy duty kind of a uh, uh, truck, maybe a Volvo, maybe a Mercedes. Uh, uh, this is Soviet in the industrialization age, kind of a crane or, or, or whatever. And then there's this, uh, this um, cart pulled by donkeys, uh, oxes, horses. Uh, then there are the street pet peddlers selling local products. Uh, then the the truck driver he just uh, hitchhikes uh, he sits next to the female uh, uh, driver uh, uh, talks extremely dirty and yet he finds her irresistible you know all these things uh, 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 he then he has to take uh, 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 he has to go find a local bathroom then he ends up in a building and he all of a sudden he realizes. Uh, this is a small work unit with personnel office, propaganda department, uh, uh, a union office, and, and, and so on. So it's a mini kind of a socialist uh, a work unit. Uh, he finds it extremely strange, and all of a sudden he's struck by this incredible, irresistible nostalgia. You know. So all these things point to one thing that he is lost in a very conventional kind of a way. But his, his loss is that of a collective nature. You know, we understand. So Mao's China is, has been crumbling you know, in terms of uh, infrastructure, in terms of social organization, value system. And yet the new, what is to come, is yet to be defined. All kinds of forces are trying to uh, lay their claims on this time space uh, to formulate their own law their own custom, to write their own histories. Uh, uh, so this is the uh, profound sense of disorientation, melancholy, this loss of your object of, if not love, definitely affection, you know, th this connection, uh, 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 renders this investigator absolutely ontologically out of hinge. That's the reason why he cannot resist any temptation. I mean, this might be the worst quality of a top investigator if you cannot hold to your own kind of a stay on course. If you always uh, helplessly find yourself sleeping with your enemy, then you are no good. But ironically, this is the top investigator. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's, he explains, he justifies his behavior. So I'm sleeping with all kinds of women because I'm so good. I use them to solve the cases and uh, or uh, to be if uh, uh, to be more kind of arrogant, I could say I I do that. Uh, I could still solve the case, even though even if you know, despite the fact that I I uh, deviate all the time, I'm still you know eventually I'm the guy, I'm the man. So this confidence uh, uh, coupled with a deep secret sense of failure, and defeat, and homelessness. Uh, I mean, whenever we start addressing these issues, the whole thing become kind of uh, understandable, clear, explicit. But uh, what I would argue is that the precondition, the literary preparedness for these uh, relatively easy to understand issues, alienation, right, homelessness, you know, disorientation, uh, immorality, that sort of thing, is made possible by this 
uh, so-called magical realist approach, which is rooted in a particular uh, 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 encounter. It's a very cruel, uh, visceral encounter wrestling with uh, contemporary Chinese reality. Uh, all these daily bombardment of information, of confusion, disorientation is systematically turned into something hilarious, uh, playful, uh, absolutely beyond the good and evil. Uh, uh, that's why when Moyam got the Nobel Liter uh, Prize in Literature, everybody almost was upset because for those critics of Chinese regime, it's a sign of the Western world capitulating to the Chinese communist regime, you know, by award, giving this prestigious award to a communist party member, a former uh, uh, military man, uh, the vice president of Chinese, all China Writers Association, who refuses to say anything about Liu Xiaobo, the other Nobel Prize winner who's still in prison, who seems to more than happy to play along, uh, who makes a lot of money, who makes a lot of, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, is extremely famous and successful. So for those, uh, I would say they said, sort of, let's say that for the time being, let's call these moral purists, you know, it's scandalous to give this award to Moya. And for these uh, serious uh, um, uh, literary types at home, it's also upsetting because Moyen seems to be too mainstream. It's no longer kind of relentlessly modernist, avant-garde about the formal innovation. You know, it's just too mainstream. Uh, uh, so he doesn't seem to uh, please anybody uh, politically, morally, uh, uh, partly because of this playfulness, which uh, uh, which makes him extremely slippery, uh, an author. You cannot pinpoint him uh, uh, to get an uh, sort of opinion, a position, a principled op op position on anything. But I think it would be unfair to, for critics or general public to, to, to demand this kind of political allegiance or positionality from a writer like him, because his playfulness is his moral stand. Uh, uh, if you really want to uh, grill him on, on, on these issues, his answer, which I thought was an honest one, is that it's all in, the, in my writing. That's the only honest answer a writer could possibly come up with. And if you uh, read his text, uh, his uh, work thoroughly, you do uh, realize there's a lot of anger, uh, 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 a lot of bitterness, a lot of critique. Uh, uh, underneath uh, the, the surface of uh, cynical playfulness or uh, getting drunk ha historically was always understood as something political. It's a moral gesture, it's a moral stand. Uh, running into the mountain, living like a hermit, uh, growing your own food, uh, refusing to participate in civil service e examination. In the, in, uh, throughout the dynasties, these acts were considered subversive uh, and radical. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Moyen is like uh, uh, seeking refuge in this literary formal playfulness. Uh, his battle is more, uh, uh, more concretely uh, more social, political, in a much more concrete way. Uh, maybe that's the reason, that's precisely the reason why he need the, uh, not necessarily the protection as mediation you know, in order to be able to, to say different things at different times and to pull them all together. Uh, so that leaves me little time to talk about uh, life and death. It's a... Uh, I would say, if I have to rank these two, it's just a very dangerous thing to do. I would, uh, uh, I, uh, my personal preference would be uh, 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 the Republic of Wine. Uh, it's simply, formalistically, it's more interesting, more explosive. But this is also a compelling, uh, much bigger work. Uh, uh, oh, one thing I should remember. Uh, there is uh, this uh, 13, 14 years of uh, interval between these two. So Republican Wine came out in the early 90s as almost an immediate direct response to Tiananmen to 1989, this ending of the euphoric decade of Chinese reform where people believed we could, the Chinese people could have the best of both worlds, socialism and capitalism. This reform is for everybody. 
after the brutal political crackdown, the whole nation just silenced. Uh, the regime uh, had very successfully managed to bribe everybody into, into this common enterprise. Get rich. If you don't rock the boat, you know, there will be something for you only in the economic uh, realm, uh, from university to, you know, to uh, uh, education, uh, to, to, to uh, bureaucracy, uh, to economy, to, uh, it's basically the, 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 the martial law has been lifted nominally, but not in the area of culture, politics, ideas, speech. So China, in a way, is still under the martial law as a result of this 89 crackdown. But in the economic domain, it's free for all. It's a more kind of a brutal form of a capitalism. I, I think it's more capitalistic than it is, <laughs> than it is in the US. Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, Professor McNally's paper will, uh, lecture will give us more on this. But I think it, if you look at the, the percentage of state enterprise in overall national economy, then China is l far less socialistic than France or Italy. In terms of uh, uh, basic social security, welfare, America is hardly the shining example in the industrial world. But uh, even America is, has far more kind of a, you know, these basic, so in terms of social safety network, it's uh, still better than China. It's, uh, China. it's improving, but uh, 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 that sort of thing. So this work is angry, is, uh, is more uh, 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 robust, it's more subversive, so that it gives sort of extra pleasure, uh, in, uh, uh, which explains its formal in in innovativeness. This is a more kind of a uh, 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 life and death warming up, uh, might be a better uh, uh, introduction to the next topic, which is the Chinese dream or Chinese identity, because simply because it tries to define a certain kind of a Chineseness, not in terms of ethnic, racial, cultural, or civilizational identity, uh, identity as we understand it here in American academia, but rather in terms of this timeless, uh, the eternal return of Chineseness. Uh, if you live and die as a Chinese, and you, are, you have a chance to choose for your next life. Second round, reincarnation. Are you going to be a Chinese? I guess if you interview like the, the stupid CCTV style, are you happy? You know, there's uh, this uh, 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 central television interview series which is mocked uh, across the nation. Are you happy? Ni xing fu ma? Uh, the uh, hilarious answer, uh, which is more yan worthy, is like ni xing fu ma, the Chinese. Uh, sounds, believe it or not, like, is your family name Fu? Mm -hmm. Xing is like, yeah. yeah. Yi Xing Fu Ma. Uh, the guy, when asked, are you happy? He said, no, my family name is Li. <laughs> 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 On live television. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I guess if you interview the urban, uh, the yuppies, maybe a significant portion of them would say, probably not, I would rather be um, American, or French, <laughs> Singaporean, you know, Japanese, or for those creative ones, you know, they can come up with a better, you know, uh, but the, the mainstream, unimaginative, you know, vulgar, uh, 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 new, nouveau riche type of things, oh, I would rather live in Canada, you know. Uh, <coughs> but not Moyen's protagonists. Well, first, they don't have a choice. Uh, second, this not having a choice, being condemned to this reincarnation over and over and over and over again, six rounds in this novel. Yeah, the logic is that it could go on forever. Uh, forces you into thinking about what Chineseness means, right? The Chineseness, we come up, up with this word only uh, as someone who uh, reads this outside of the immediate Chinese world. For those who are in, they don't think of Chineseness. For them, this is life, this is meaning, this is life and the death, and what's the point? You know, that this is the, uh, what makes this novel extremely interesting. Life and death are wearing me out is a Buddhist jargon, but Moyen doesn't really know much about Buddhism. He just happens to uh, uh, step on this 
this line, 生死疲劳 life, death, you know, the vanity, futility of life through all these, uh, you know, uh, labor or effort, you know. Uh, uh, he likes this, this, the, these four characters when he sees, saw, saw it at a, a Buddhist temple in northern China and decides to use it as the, the, the title of his novel. The story is also very, very simple. Uh, on January the 1st, 1950, you know, New China, Mao's China was founded in, in October the 1st, 1949. So he picks January the 1st, 1950, the beginning of the second half of the 20th century. Yeah. And it ends with uh, uh, December the 31st, is there December the 31st, 2000. So the end of an, the last millennia, millennium. So this is the, the time frame, exactly 50 years five decades, five incarnations. Uh, on January the 1st, 1950, the landlord, the local landlord is arrested and executed because land reform, you know, the campaign, this redistribution of, of land property to the peasantry, uh, that's the founding legitimacy of Chinese communism. Which if you think about it in terms of political economy, it's very ironic, right? Chinese communism is based not on abolishing private property, but by inventing it, by distributing uh, small pieces of land, by reproducing, reinventing petty producers' utopia in China. You know, that's the foundation. Uh, and uh, for those who, uh, who you may not know this, the, the, the Chinese name, official Chinese name for the Korean War is called the Kang Mei Yuan Chao, Resist America, Aid Korea, Defend your home, uh, defend your family, and protect your land. It's not an empty general slogan, but it it's pointedly uh, includes this land reform, the, pro the, the result of land reform. We give you that. We, the communists, give you this piece of land. Are you going to let the nationalists backed by America, by this evil imperialist America, to come back and take, take your land away? If you don't want that ha uh, to happen, join us, fight the nationalists, protect the socialist state, fight the Americans. So it was very successful. Uh, uh, anyhow, he's executed, uh, they put a bullet through his brain, uh, it's a very nasty scene, I won't read it. <laughs> but, he feels he's so terribly wronged, so he appeals to the Yama king, the king of the underworld. He says, oh, I'm wrong. And this Yama king is very bureaucratic. It's like any provincial governor of China listening impatiently to these pe poor peasants, you know, coming to the capital to complain. He says, oh, okay, okay, enough is enough. I will send you back. But there's no guarantee you will be sent back as human. So he first round, he's go he, he goes back as an uh, ox. Second round as, oh, first round as a donkey. Uh, donkey gets chopped up and eaten you know, uh, because there was a famine. Uh, so he appeals again, he sends, he's sent back again as the second round as an ox. The ox finds himself in the middle of uh, uh, socialist collectivization. So, so this is the, the evolution of Chinese socialism. First invention of, of, uh, of private property, then taking it away. In the, in, through the process of collectivization. That's the transition from the so-called new democracy, namely the kind of a united front between communists and the national bourgeoisie evolution into socialism, you know, uh, getting rid of uh, private property, collectivization, uh, state or, or collective uh, property, uh, ownership. The ox identifies with his uh, master, who is the former uh, 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 laborer, the, the bondsman you know, of, uh, of, of the working for that uh, dead or dead uh, reincarnated uh, uh, landlord. Both refuse to accept collectivization. Both hold on to this petty produ producer's utopia. This is my land. This is my property. You know, Chairman Mao gave it, gave it to me. I'm not going to let anybody take it away. So they refuse to leave that piece of land. It's a very poetic, m romantic uh, scene in the novel, very rare in Moyen, which actually embarrassingly, embarrassingly almost reveals his own 
moral stand. He is with the Chinese peasants. They believe there is a timeless value system, a form of life, ethic order, uh, codes, and everything. He despises all these, uh, the rap rapidity of change, urbanization, growth, globalization. In that way, he's like a reactionary, <laughs> a conservative, a cultural conservative. But uh, I, I'm also teaching Balzac in a, a different sort of AYU class. Balzac is a well-known monarchist. He was not progressive, but doesn't prevent him uh, from writing the most critical you know, uh, uh, representation of that period of French history, you know, revolution, uh, development of French capitalism, uh, all that. So the scene is, uh, the, the peasant is called the blue face. He's born with a b blue birthmark. So kind of interesting, because he's the last peasant in China, last private farmer in China. He's surrounded by an ocean of collectivized commune land, right? So he has to bring his cow ox to work on his small piece of private land. Uh, no trespassing is allowed because they make it, everything very difficult for him as a punishment. So he could only sneak out of the house and the cultivate the land in moonlight. So I'm very, very careful. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, uh, uh, oil painting-like uh, 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 tribute, uh, tribute to, uh, to uh, private farming. Uh, eventually, the ox is tortured to death because the commune leader, uh, the landlord, uh, the, the peasant's own, the, no, the dead landlord's biological son, which means the ox is his father, right? But the son wants to perform as a, you know, to draw a line between him and his uh, 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 family uh, history. His, you know, uh, he will have to uh, uh, kind of outdo others in, in showing his uh, revolutionary radicalism. So he burns and uh, you know, uh, burns this cow to, to death. It's an extremely, excruciatingly painful scene, uh, how this ox is tortured to death uh, as an embodiment of class enemy. You know? mm. so, so here, the second reincarnation. The third reincarnation is the pig who lives happily. You know, it's a constant bliss because the pig is born into the Cultural Revolution. Uh, or authority and order and hierarchy is dismantled, it's free for all. The pig becomes the uh, kind of a king of all pigs, lives like the life of uh, a pig emperor who appoints his own concubines and uh, you know, uh, who leads this uh, massive fights uh, against other tri pig tribes or, or against the human. It's just the most unreal the most magical episode uh, in the novel, but this sheer carnivalesque uh, uh, atmosphere, this energy, weirdly reveals Moyen's take on the Cultural Revolution. Uh, it's like a carnival. Uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the pig eventually decides, you know, he's tired of this world and it swims along the, uh, the river uh, the last thing the pig sees is Chairman Mao sitting on top of Moon on the day of uh, September the 6th, 1976. That's the day Mao died. So the pig actually, uh, he, I guess he, the pig will have to die in order to make room for the next reincarnation, but no direct mentioning of his death. Uh, in the pig section, we find this, that this is similar to the function, the literary representative function of drunkwardness, you know, drinking in Republic of Wine. The pig oftentimes uh, sinks into this philosophical mode, existential mode, the sort of a Hamlet kind of a, uh, reflection, so to be or not to be. Uh, but that's not the pig's question. The pig's question is, am I human or am I just a pig? Because the, as the, no, uh, the novel arranges, the humanity gradually fades away. The anima animality gradually uh, occupies the biological space of, of, of the male protagonist. You know? So it's very gradual. Uh, 
the pig reaches the tipping point. So he sits there. Uh, there's a very philosophical line. Says, then my conclusion is, as a pig, I'm a clear-eyed. I'm rational. You know, I'm powerful. I'm calculating. Uh, I'm political, you know, I can, I can do everything there is to be done in order to hold on to my power, you know, uh, but as a human being, I'm so confused. So this is a hilarious line. Uh, Mo Yan, when we, we invited him to come to NYU to do a bilingual reading, he paused here. He loved that pig section here. He's, uh, he read uh, large uh, passages from it. And uh, then he paused and uh, looked at the audiences. Actually, I identify with the pig. You can call me a pig so, because I love beautiful women. I like food. I, I eat as if there's no tomorrow. I like to enjoy life. You know, uh, call me a pig. Uh, so in other words, there is something allegorical about this pig-human relationship. I think um, you could generalize this line uh, in today's China. We could say, as a um, as a uh, let's say urban professional, I'm clear-eyed. I know what it takes to be successful in this world. But as a human being. In the Chinese world, the, the, the discourse of confinement, you should add everything. Uh, you should add Chinese before everything. Uh, as, but as a Chinese, I'm confused. Or as a human, I'm confused. Uh, as a, so in every uh, uh, clearly defined social, political, economic category, people, contemporary Chinese people know what to do. And yet when it comes to these fundamentally human issues, what it is to be human, nobody seems to be able to come up with a, any clear answer. We are just, collectively we accept, we admit that we're confused. Uh, so this is the, this sort of, the, the anima animality and humanity blended in such a way that uh, you are clear eyed you are driven, right? Uh, you pursue happiness. Uh, you fight for what you want. Uh, uh, you think like, uh, like an economic man, you know, homo economicus. Okay, namely as in, an incipient, incipient bourgeois, bourgeois in the his historical sense. Yeah. We're, we know what we're doing. We can do just as well as anyone else. But when it comes to human world, man, it's a mess. Nobody knows. We can barely Im remember. Uh, uh, we know there's a lineage running through, but it's fading away. You know? this, is, uh, this is the kind of a weirdly melancholic moment uh, the happy pig experiences. And then, of course, the, the next incarnation is dog. dog uh, lives in the reform and opening period, Deng Xiaoping's China. Uh, the smell, uh, the sense of smell is acute, right? He can sense his uh, uh, um, master's uh, master having an affair because the perfume uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't smell the right one. Uh, he follows him uh, into all these business banquets. Or, uh, uh, it, it's like a detective story. You know? The dog is very good. The, the viewpoint is very low. It's a street level kind of a viewpoint. Uh, and then the donkey, oh, no, the monkey. Uh, eventually, it's the uh, baby, newborn baby, the most recent reincarnation of the dead landlord. As a baby, as an infant boy with a big head, looks like an alien. Yeah, like E.T., uh, who uh, starts talking about his own life story, uh, which is the beginning of the novel. It, the novel, the beginning and the end meet exactly. The, the first few sentences are exactly identical. But the 50 years in between, uh, encompassed, uh, captured by this uh, structure. Yeah, maybe we just, I just stop here and see if we have some questions. And uh, with that, we can 
it's a kind of a warming up for the for the next one on Chinese identity. Yeah. Yeah. His, his writing is very playful, very provocative, especially for his titles. At first, I thought his name was Wu Yan. I thought Wu Yan is more interesting than Luo Yan. So I don't know how many artists actually understand what his meaning yeah. is. Yeah. That's the first question the uh, interviewer, uh, there was after the Nobel Prize uh, announcement, I got all kinds of interviews uh, from uh, like national uh, uh, public radios. The first question was this, Moyen means no talk, which means censorship, which means self-censorship, is that so? I said no, and then the, the interviewer got very upset. Of course it means that, <laughs> how could you <laughs> say otherwise? No is no, but uh, it, because Mo, his real name is Guan Mo, yeah, his fa family name is Guan. It's a kind of a common, not unusual, but the common name in, in, in that area in Shandong province. Mo Ye, the, the middle character is uh, with the practical of speech, Yan, and the Mo. So he just take the middle character out of his real name and the switched order, so Mo Ye. It, coincidentally, it does mean uh, don't talk, but actually it means don't talk too much. Don't talk too hastily. It's more like a, a grandfather saying, to, uh, telling his grandson, if you don't talk that much, nobody assumes you are, you are mute. So it's kind of a almost fatherly, grandfatherly warning to the little uh, boy. The, 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 and Moyen often it depicts, uh, th there's a little Moyen character in his novels as the little village rascal. Everybody hates that, that boy because he talks too much. Uh, so uh, it has a kind of a, this traditional peasant wisdom flavor to it. Of course, it, uh, we could, uh, and it was in the early 80s, right, when he named himself Moyen, came up with this pen name. So at that time, everything was still very uh, open and liberal and cosmopolitan. Uh, at the moment of its inception, I doubt it had anything to do with, uh, with political repression or that sort of thing. So it's a kind of a free interpretation uh, of, of Moyen. It has something to do with yen, with speech, with language. So it's all very fitting. And it's more, adds a little uncertainty, a little a drama to it. I thought it was a very memorable uh, pen name. Uh, to disappoint you, there's nothing uh, about ethnicity whatsoever. So this, uh, presumably, it's all Chinese or ethnic Han people doing this sort of thing. Yeah. Usually, uh, Moyen is also uh, teasable uh, in, in this regard. The most Chinese writers uh, have uh, uh, are not concerned about ethnicity, gender, class. In that regard, they are refreshingly apolitical or naive or you know, it's just not an issue for them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if yeah. that very absence yeah. then speak something about contemporary Chinese society. Yeah, it's, it's predominantly Han people, you know, thinking uh, China means ethnic Han people, or you know, China equals universal civilization. Still a little bit of that. We can talk about that in uh, the issue of identity or Chinese dream. But there's really little mentioning of ethnicity. Although there's uh, when the Dr. Li's grandfather, that guru of uh, liquor producing, right? He, he's the personal, he's the inventor of this called thing called ape liquor. <laughs> it's very funny. Uh, maybe it's the, a, a mockery of Mao Tai or Wu Liangye, those you know, leading national brand. He said he uh, 
goes into the mountains and lives there uh, for years and play living and uh, playing with apes and it comes back with this idea of ape uh, liquor. That's the kind of, uh, let's say, the, close, the closest point uh, the characters of Liquorland ever get to nature. This is a, the ethnic Han stereotype always says these ethnic people are closer to nature and the, we, the Han Chinese are so removed from, we live in a cultural landscape, whereas those live in nature. That sort of a, uh, that moment may have a little flavor of this, you know, uh, uh, of that, but uh, no ethnicity is mentioned there whatsoever. Yeah. Yes? So I want to thank you. I see. It's a very good question. I think uh, everything constantly changes places with everything else. So they're all definitely the so-called low oftentimes get elevated to this, the level of, uh, of, uh, of the sublime or something eternal. The oxygen is indeed uh, this kind of a utopia. Uh, uh, and, uh, and but the primarily the, the so-called low seems to want to occupy the new sort of a newly discovered uh, horizon of state of nature. This is what is natural. Uh, life and death and suffering and you know, all that things or peasant mode of life, these are natural compared to which these, you know, the communist rhetoric or the state discourse or the discourse of a marketplace, uh, globalization, urbanized, all these are the, the te Moyen's novels take pleasure in tearing those things down. Uh, Western readers still assume that most of his uh, critical edge is against socialist uh, state discourse. That's certainly true, but increasingly uh, they become the same thing. You can never set uh, up a, a separate Chinese state and a, and a market capitalism. Yeah. Uh, we read in Western media, mainstream Western media, that uh, oh, you have the free market, good. You have a, dicta a dictatorial state or authoritarian state, bad. They've so conveniently uh, f leave out the fact that the free market in China is a product of the state. It's like Tsar's Russia. If you want to make money, it's the Tsar allowing to make money. It's not you making money. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, and Moyen is very, uh, his capture of Chinese reality is, is, is accurate in that sense. Uh, he, sees, he sees the mixture uh, relentlessly, uh, 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 intimately. Um, therefore, uh, uh, as he tears something down, uh, some, something else it seems to be emerging to the top, but that doesn't mean that that thing is the new standard, is the good thing. Rather, this up and down, this chaos is the state, uh, is the normal state. And it's the aesthetic state Moyen tries to enjoy. You know. So this is, uh, creates this moral kind of a political stress because you know, if we try, w really want to make a decision, uh, we often f find ourselves uh, attempts uh, frustrated by this constant deferral, you know, uh, but rather say, look at this, look at this. You know, the, uh, uh, 
But uh, I forgot to mention one thing, if I may. I'll just uh, 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 say this uh, as a way to uh, uh, address your question. I think uh, uh, in, since our interest is in, in, in studying contemporary China, um, we should try to avoid using uh, formally, stylistically uninteresting <laughs> works to make a transparent point. Because that, if we do that, we will uh, do a disservice to the literary cultural field. Uh, because there's a long-running tradition in this country, in particular, uh, to use um, contemporary Chinese literature as raw materials, as sociological data. If you want to study if Chinese communist regime is too popular, let's read some magazine and uh, you know analyze quantitati uh, qual quantitatively almost to see uh, to, uh, what's the percentage of complaint, what's the uh, percentage of reporting uh, of local uh, corruption, famine, that sort of thing. It the side the down side of that is to show to the students that. Uh, uh, there's no interesting literature is produced in that country, or they are still writing like 19th century European realists, like Dreiser, like Sinclair Lewis in our country, whereas we have already moved to, you know, uh, 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 we dominate this uh, 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 domain of uh, creativity, innovation. Uh, that's a heavy price to pay. Um, because the close connection between area studies and uh, the national security uh, system, there's a tendency of reading uh, cultural material materials as if they were just intelligence sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, briefings. Uh, uh, the field has uh, really come a long way. Uh, that is already kind of a marginal. So still, we, I think we should keep an eye on not uh, letting that uh, uh, come back sort of uh, if we uh, don't choose uh, these literary texts uh, carefully. There is a, a, a great deal of energy, productivity, imagination. Uh, I think uh, it, uh, it uh, conforms to the more general observation that usually a mature, developed civilization tends to concentrate on uh, a analysis, you know, the more rational uh, theory. The, the, the global grand division labor. This is, of course, stereotype, and it's not always true if we look locally. But on the whole, I think the West uh, does theorization, analysis, you know, scholarship at a far more sophisticated uh, uh, level, whereas the raw energy. Uh, I mean, I'm always more impressed when I read literature from. Uh, from China, from Latin America, from Arab world. I mean, the, 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 you know, well, as New Yorkers, we always enjoy Woody Allen movies. But I think we wouldn't call that uh, uh, explosive raw energy. It's just uh, uh, getting this comfortable confirmation that we live in this uh, you know, upper west side type of a Greenwich Village type of a uh, a, a semi decadent, semi cynical intellectual world. I mean, that sort of thing. I think uh, we should uh, uh, be careful uh, when we uh, choose our, our, our texts. The formal, stylistic, aesthetic dimensions are vital for, for our under understanding of an emerging society, an emerging culture, an em emerging uh, uh, state. Uh, Social scientists. Uh, uh, really often get it wrong precisely because they tend to uh, neglect these uh, things about people's understanding or imagination or emotional truth. Uh, these things are you know, complicated and murky. I mean, it's, there's no clear uh, 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 quantifiable things to, to, to say about those things, but they offer this uh, uh, and uh, uh, I forgot in English language, precise or accurate, which one is more accurate or precise? It's like uh, humanities constitute an accurate science. So assuming accurate is the good word, whereas precise is bad. Whereas social sciences occupy the precise knowledge. But we should uh, aim uh, at understanding. You know. uh, there is such thing, I think, called uh, you know, intimate profound, in, in that sense, to that extent, accurate understanding. But that's not precise. That's not uh, uh, a 
that's how the social science are practicing. We probably should stop here after this. Yeah, I think so. For sure. Um, my question is about translation. Translation to me is a form of sharing, of introducing a culture from one to the other. I find that's a very wonderful mission. But at the same time, uh, it's going to be very challenging when you translate. You need to be proficient in both languages to do that. And one time a Chinese scholar, that's what he told me. He said, bad translation is worse than no translation. So that made me think, like, um, when should I share? Do I need to get a certain level to do that, or should I still keep trying to do what I can? So what is your view on that? Yeah, that's a very important question. Uh, Howard Goldblatt, the translator of Moyan, is a fabulous translator, but uh, he's not always the most uh, well, accurate translator. <laughs> he, te he has a tendency of uh, deleting large chunks of the text because he thinks, oh, this American readers are not going to put up, uh, put up with this. You know, too complicated. A lot of it, uh, he doesn't like footnotes, doesn't like. I mean, so, to, to our horror, that we realize a lot of uh, fabulous sections in the pig uh, chapter uh, were removed. Uh, but I guess he has his, as a seasoned, experienced translator, he has his own reason. Uh, this is not ideal, but in this case, I would just say imperfect tra perfect translations are still better than no translation. At least we get a flavor of it, we uh, gain an eclipse of the general contour of this thing. Then we can, you know, experts can work on the details and gradually this knowledge uh, will transmit uh, through you know, the veins and so on and so forth. So translation is a big challenge. Howard Goldblatt told me that uh, uh, this country is really bad uh, when it comes to reading translated literature. Uh, uh, on, in the American literary market, translated work represents 1% of the total consumption. Whereas in Asia or in Europe, usually it's 40%. In Japan, I guess it's 60%, who knows. Uh, uh, so the uh, reading translation or watching a foreign film with <laughs> subtitles, these kind of things are not that popular in, the, in this country, so we have a lot to work on. Uh, it's a pity uh, not to read uh, other people's stories about themselves, you know, written in different languages. So, uh, if we don't do that, our views are really confined to, you know, to this monolingual uh, uh, world. Um, I, I believe comparative literature is first and foremost about uh, study translated uh, experiences and you know uh, uh, if, if you uh, but the first thing is uh, is still translation without this uh, uh, thorough even universal language acquisition uh, translation is the, still the main venue for us to encounter with uh, other people's uh, you know, narratives. Um, it, when it comes to modern Chinese literature, uh, Howard Goldblatt stands out as a creative translator. He's almost like a ri creative writer, you know, uh, translating his fellow writers, whereas uh, the majority of translators are uh, academic translators. They are professors working on modern Chinese literature who uh, develop a particularly close relationship with a particular writer and they translate him or her. Uh, these are usually very faithful, very um, uh, solid, but they may or may not, I'm not passing general of, uh, 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 comment here, uh, but they may not have the kind of a, the, the literary fire. Uh, uh, you know, this is the uh, you can you have to live with this. Uh, uh, everybody knows the English translator of uh, Thomas Mann is so wonderful that Thomas Mann is lucky uh, uh, because he has such a fabulous English translator. Uh, some writers are lucky. Some national literatures are lucky. Uh, I hope Chinese literature will become uh, luckier uh, in the future. <laughs> so shall we take a break? Okay. Yeah. Okay.